All right, so a 2.5D element is something which appears to be 3D without having an actual 3D environment. Um, in After Effects, <coughs> it has 3D, but it's, all right. but it's not actual 3D. Um, if I created a solid in here <coughs> and we go to rotate, it only rotates in this direction, basically like flat to our image. Um, if I check a box though, now I can rotate it like this, and now it appears that it's 3D, but it's not actually 3D. We'll get more into this um, after this assignment. We'll start doing more of this kind of stuff, okay? So there's no actual geometry like polygons and nerves and that kind of stuff. It's just like a, a perspective kind of thing. Like in Photoshop, when you say make it 3D, it makes it 3D, but not really, okay? So that's what 2.5D is. It's like fake 3D. 2D is obviously 2D. We have um, left and right, up and down, X and Y. 3D is actual 3D. So we would have an actual like 3D world that we would uh, utilize, okay? Um, now the reason that we have to discern between each one of these is because After Effects can work with 3D programs, but it isn't a 3D environment. So I could take a 3D thing from another program, export parts of it out and bring those into After Effects and make movies using it or utilize those elements but I can't actually bring the 3D geometry into After Effects and use it right there, okay? Um, adjustment layers, we've talked about, oops, let me undo this. If we make an adjustment layer, then anything we do to that adjustment layer happens to everything below it. So if I go to um, this bottom layer and I just add a checkerboard, and then I go to my adjustment layer and I add a hue and saturation. I say colorize. There we go. Now that's colorized. Now if I take this and move it there and then I duplicate it, then anything that that adjustment layer falls under or is under the adjustment layer has that effect on it. So if I had 50 layers, I could recolor those 50 layers and literally, um, most of these things we would typically use that for. Typically you're gonna use it for color correction. I would use my final image, color correct the whole thing so that it blends nicely together. Think about, um, you've used Instagram before, at least seen it, right? You take a picture, you put it in Instagram, and then wow, it looks so much better. That's the kind of thing that you should be thinking of. What can I do to enhance this to make it better? Adjustment layers and uh, color correction is typically where that would fall into, okay? Um, but anything inside here, if I wanted to put a blur on all this stuff, I can go to my adjustment layer and go to blur and say Gaussian and then crank it up and then everything's blurry underneath. Um, alpha is a channel used to carry transparency between programs. So if I drew something inside of Photoshop and I wanted to bring that into After Effects and still maintain that transparent area, I would create an alpha channel, okay? Inside of After Effects, we can see what that looks like by using this. This changes what colors we're seeing. After Effects is a screen program, so we wouldn't print After Effects. So it's going to be RGB. Um, one of those channels after RGB is alpha. So this is showing us what our transparency is. So inside Photoshop, we could draw a picture of a dog, save that dog with an alpha channel, bring that in After Effects, and then the dog wouldn't have a white background. Without the alpha channel, there's a picture of a dog with a white background. Uh, an animatic is a rough animation uh, used to understand the timing of an animation. Uh, more and more companies are like when they did Avengers, they would go to the company and say, here's the, the camera shots we're thinking of, here's the storyboards. They would build all the models, they would bring that into there, and they would basically, um, nowadays, they're creating a video game looking uh, presentation of the movie. It's pretty awesome. Um, and then they take that, tweak it, modify it, and then when they actually shoot, they know what the uh, angles are for the cameras that they need, they know where the actors should be, they know lighting, they know all this stuff way before they even actually get onto the set, which is amazing. They make the movie several times throughout, yep. <clears throat> and that's the same thing for commercials. It's all in your budget and how much money they can spend and timing and everything, it's how detailed they can go. Um, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> Uh, bit depth is just how, uh, how much data is stored within a pixel. So all the stuff that we're dealing with inside of After Effects right now is 8-bit. Um, and the way that we would know that is because right down here, and it's hard to see, 
but right there it says 8 BPC, it means 8 bits per channel. That means that there's 255, 256 different colors um, in the red channel, 256 in the blue, and 256 in the green, okay? Um, the more bits you get, the more colors you have, okay? Uh, when you work with stuff like 3D, sometimes you might work at a 32-bit level. There's only about 16 million different combinations of colors, or 16 million different colors inside of an 8-bit image. Inside of 32-bit, there's like mind-blowing numbers, a lot. Uh, a bug is a small graphic in the corner of the screen used to identify a channel. You've seen those before. Channel 4 pops up. There's a little graphic that shows up. That's a bug, okay? Those annoying things. Uh, the bumper is a short sequence of plays in between shots to advertise an upcoming show. So it's not a full-blown commercial. It's, you know, coming up next on Channel 4, the news, and then they go to that. That's what a bumper is. Uh, channel is the individual parts that make up an image. So the alpha channel is a channel. Red, green, blue, those are all channels. Um, when you look at these, they are not colored. So when I go to the blue channel, it's not blue. There's nothing up there right now because there's no color in blue. There you go. Uh, when I go to red, even though the projector is kind of tinting it, it's not red. There's no color to it. Red is a value of gray. Green is a value of gray. And black, um, blue is a value of gray. When the software puts those three channels together, that's where you get color. Okay. Now, the reason that we would use something like that is if you've ever seen a uh, green screen or a blue screen or any of that, um, the reason that they use green or blue or yellow or whatever color they use is because that color is not typically used in like a person. Like right now, uh, this shirt doesn't have any green, okay? So I could be in front of a green screen and it would be fine. If I was wearing a blue shirt in front of a blue screen, that wouldn't work. If I'm wearing a green shirt in front of a green screen, it wouldn't work. Um, the opposite color or the color you're not wearing at all is what you would use. The channel helps us select that stuff. It helps us extract that because I can go into the green channel and say, where's all the green? I want to pull that out so I don't see the green. Uh, Cineware is a plugin that allows you to work between Cinema 4D and After Effects. Um, I said you can't bring 3D geometry into After Effects, but you can use Cineware, which is a plugin that allows you to use Cinema 4D model stuff inside there and it ties it directly to After Effects, okay? So if you go into your 3D software and you put your text and it's like 3D text, you going back into After Effects, you'll see that 3D text, okay? It's pretty neat. Um, it's slow. Um, where is that? Layer, new. So I would go here to max on Cinema 4D file. It would open up Cinema 4D and connect all the stuff and blah, blah, blah. It's slow. I typically don't use it, uh, but you can. Uh, a codec is just the way that it takes our stuff in After Effects, it compresses it, puts it into a video, and then pushes it out. You've used codecs forever if you've used any Adobe products. When you're in Photoshop and you save a TIFF, that TIFF is a compressed file. And the codec is the software which allows you to decode it and then re-encode it and blah, blah, blah. It makes stuff smaller. It makes, stuff, um, it makes bigger stuff smaller so that you can then view it. Okay? When we are taking our movie... Uh, do I still have that open? There it is. When we look at our movie, you'll see that our movies vary in different sizes. Uh, but if I had an image, okay, so these are about five seconds. If I had an image that was um, of each frame, it would definitely be more than like two megabytes. But what the software is able to do is take that information and shrink it down into this little video file. And then when we want to watch it, it opens it back up and reads that information. So the codec is what does that. There's different ones for different things. So if you've ever used a JPEG, sometimes um, it gives you that little slider. Obviously, there's quality settings. But then there's also some other options, say baseline, optimized, some other stuff. There's a TIFF that has some different options. Uh, QuickTime has different options. Okay. Uh, collapse transformations. When you work in one composition, and this is more stuff that we'll get into um, today. Oops, I didn't want that. So I work in one composition, and let's say I make a star here. There we go. And then I drag this composition two into composition one. There's that star, and then I scale it up. Yeah, 
Okay, so you can see how ugly that star is looking right now. What happened is we drew a vector image. When we brought it into this composition, After Effects just says, well, that's probably pixels. So it just realizes that they're pixels, and if you scale pixels up, it looks disgusting. So there's this button right here, which is Collapse Transformation. It goes through and says, okay, if this is a, uh, an image or something from another comp, I'm going to go and do some research and figure out what it is, and then come back, and if it is vector, then I can smooth it out. Okay? So you don't need to know, like, collapse transformations. As long as you know it looks disgusting and I click that button and it fixes it, then it works. <laughs> okay? You'll need to know it for the test, but that's about it. It does, right? Especially on the projector. That looks really horrible. And you pick better colors. Uh, color grading is what I talked about before, where we are looking at different ways that we want to show off our stuff. Instead of just doing, like, I pick blue, and I'm going to leave it as blue at the end. Figuring out a way to kind of blend everything together so that it looks um, nice and neat. When you look at movies like, oops, it's way too much. Uh, matrix colors. Nope. Of course I would get that. There you go. So when you look at something like The Matrix or any movies, there's a lot of time that goes invo that's involved in picking out a color scheme for the entire movie. And it may not be right away um, obvious, but you can definitely see in these areas, there's a lot of greens that are happening where in these areas there's a lot of blues happening, right? So that's a whole thing that they go into. When they shoot it, they're not filming everything blue, they film it somewhat regular, and then they modify it and tweak it so that it looks the color combination they want, okay? So that's very important to do. Uh, composition, that's what we've been working with. We make a composition, we throw our stuff in. Uh, continuously rasterize, uh, that's the same button, okay? So that's actually continuously rasterizing slash collapsing transformations. Uh, ease, we've talked about before. This is just taking our keyframes, which are linear, and then easing them so that they have a transition, obviously. Um, an expression is a mini program that we can use to automate something. So let's delete the star shape here and this, because I don't need all that stuff. Let me get rid of these. All right, so I'm going to make a star right here, and I'm going to put a pivot there, and then move this down here. There we go. Okay, so let's say I want to animate this star just kind of pulsing, okay? So I would go to, let's say here, I'd set a keyframe, I'd go up a little bit, I would make it bigger. I would go up a little bit, I'd make it smaller. There we go. I'd go up a little bit, I'd make it bigger up a little bit and make it smaller. I could speed up this process by copying keyframes. Okay, and I get this. Wonderful. Uh, but that's the slow way to do it. If I decided my boss says, hey, I need that to go faster, I need it to go slower, I need something else to happen, I have to go back and redo all my keyframes. Okay, and that might be for a million different things. If I alt-click on my stopwatch instead of just regular clicking on it, this thing pops up. This is basically a little expression that I can write, like programming, and that program will then drive or control that, that feature. Okay? So if I were to say, um, if I were to remember, hopefully, is that the correct one? Oh, that's the wrong one. Uh, the problem I have is that all these softwares are um, different languages, so I will just go with something simple. What was that? It's using JavaScript. Um, yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of little things inside there. So one of the expressions that comes with After Effects is wiggle, and wiggle will basically do that. It'll wiggle between different values. Um, there we go. So let's see what this does. All right, not a whole lot there. Let's change one of the numbers. There we go. All right, so now just by changing this first number here, I'm able to take the animation and make it really quick. The one I just had, it went super slow. If I change this number even further, oops, I have to put a number in. There you go. Now it's going to go even faster. If I change this number, 
It'll go even further, okay? So that's the cool thing about expressions is that just by changing a couple numbers, we can come back with a lot of different values, okay? Um, and then we can also take this and I could tie this information onto something else. So if I'm trying to like sync up two items animating together, it's very easy to do with expressions, okay? Um, there's also people who, that's what they do, After Effects expressions. They make tutorials. Here's a bunch of expression stuff. You can find them. Any of the advanced people who do After Effects, they're using expressions one way or another, okay? The people are doing this for a living. So you want to go in there and at least understand um, the basics of it so that you can obviously utilize it a lot more. Uh, footage is just video or images. So all the stuff so far we've created inside After Effects. If we were to shoot a video and bring it into After Effects, that would be called footage. If we had a um, 3D sequence, brought that in, that would be a piece of footage as well. Frames per second, we've talked about how many frames are in one second. It's just a literal translation of that one. That should be like a no-brainer on the test. Um, an ident is a short animation used to identify a channel. Um, you've seen those before with like HBO, the being of HBO's shows, they would have these um, uh, show where it would have like these stars spinning around and it would say HBO, right? That's an ident. Uh, the in and out point of a source file, we've talked about this too. So this piece of clip starts right here and it ends right there. If we use the alt and bracket keys, we can control where that cuts off. That way that piece of video or that star only happens within that range. Also, if I double click it, oh, if I make a new solid, there we go, and I double click that, this is that same area. So if I go here and say here's the in point, there's the out point, you can see down there how it also clips it. Okay, so sometimes you may have a video, you want to focus on that, cut it up. Um, a key uh, is a method of a mat. So this is different than a keyframe. Um, this is when we're talking about a green screen or a blue screen. The green or blue is the key. We're extracting that out of the image. We're pulling it out, okay? Uh, keyframe is a point in the animation. So that should be a no-brainer. Uh, a lens flare. If you've seen Michael Bay movies, you know what lens flares are. <laughs> Not anything. <laughs> there you go. Lens flares. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it's amazing, right? Uh, I forget what movie it was. I think it was one of the Takens. Way too many lens flares in that movie. Uh, well. They're supposed to make it look realistic. The point of a lens flare is if you've ever taken uh, a photograph, if your lens is by the sun or angled towards the sun, the sun's light hits off the lens and you get a lens flare. So typically they add it to the films to make it feel like it's more realistic. Lens flares like where there's no window. Right, where there's no windows, there's just a lens flare. Um, After Effects comes with, generate, Lens flare. After Effects comes with the same three lens flares um, that Photoshop has, that Photoshop has always had since I've been using it since version two. So, so these are the same ones. These are horrible ones. They are horrible. Um, on these computers, there's a package, uh, Red Giant, I forget where it is. I don't have it on mine, I don't think yet. Uh, but anyway, it's a lens flare pack. And it's like amazing lens flares. That's where they get these lens flares from. <laughs> there you go. So these are the kinds of lens flares you would get with those. Yeah. So never use the ones in After Effects. Those are horrible. Don't even use the ones in Photoshop. You need to use the lens flare pack and customize what it looks like. Okay. Um, linear workflow. Um, so when you work in 3D, or on the computer at all, you, the images are typically, they're adjusted so that you can view them. Um, linear workflow is a way to take a 3D item, bring in After Effects, and make sure that your colors are, night, are consistent in the colors you chose. Sometimes you'll pick blue, and it won't be blue in 3D. When you get an After Effects, you need to know that so that you can correct it. 
Um, all the stuff that we're going to be dealing with in this class won't have to worry about that, but there's more options here where we can say, um, yep, 32 bits a channel, and then we pick our working space, we linearize it, blah, 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 and then we're good. This class, we don't need to worry about it, but you still need to know what it is in case you go into the world and they need you to know. Uh, a lower third you've seen before too, if you watch the news or you've seen anything where they have like the little thing at the bottom of the screen, right? They pop up, who's the news anchor, or who's on the screen, these kinds of things, those kinds of things. Okay. Uh, a mask is similar to a mat, except we draw a mask. So if I wanted part of this lens flare to be cut out, I can go to my pen tool and cut out part of the lens flare. That's a mask. <laughs> uh, a mat is a mask used to cut out a path, okay? So we've already used mats before. When we have that other image and we're using the other image's transparency to drive this transparency, that's a mat, okay? Um, if you had a green screen piece of footage, you may cut out the person, create a mat from them, and then put them onto something else. And you may need to create other mats. If someone walks behind that person, you have to have that masked out or matted out, okay? So they're all kind of work together. Those areas, typically the mask mats and keys are where people get a little bit confused. Uh, motion blur, everyone should know motion blur is. However, when I graded stuff, several people only clicked one box on and not both boxes on. Let's get rid of our lens flare. Let's color this a different color so we can see it. There we go. And let's scale it down. Whoops. There we go. Okay. No motion blur. I click this button on, still no motion blur. I click this button on, still no motion blur. Both buttons have to be clicked. You can tell there's motion blur because there's motion blur. Right? So make sure you have that on your stuffs. Uh, motion graphics is what we're doing, animating graphics. Pretty straightforward. Uh, onion skinning is a f uh, typically what people would do when they are animating um, something digitally. They'll have the previous frame shown like in transparent mode so you can see what it is you're drawing. Photoshop has this as well um, like that. After Effects, ha you can like force it in After Effects but you typically don't need it because we can see the animation. A lot of this is for when you're trying to either troubleshoot something um, or you're drawing it frame by frame and you need to see where the last frame was so you know what to draw, okay? Uh, parallax is what happens when you look out your window while you're driving, the side window, and you see that stuff that's way in the distance is moving a lot different than stuff that is very close to the car, right? You've seen that before, okay? So in After Effects, we can create a uh, vision of Parallax I'm just going to create two shapes here, and one will be red and one will be blue. And I'm going to take the blue one and I'm going to move it down. Um, if you caught it, I switched on 3D because obviously for parallax, we need it to look like it's 3D. Make that bigger. Okay. <clears throat> so right now we can't tell a huge difference between the two. Um, I'm also going to all, uh, assign a checkerboard to these so we can actually see some movement. There we go. That's horrible. We'll just do normal. Okay. And we'll also make this bigger checkerboards. Okay. So it looks like it's pretty much just 2D images. Um, I'm going to add a camera inside here one and if I go and I move my camera you can see how the back image is moving a lot different than the front image because things that are closer to us move different than things that are further from us because of how our the parallax works yep so one of our assignments will actually be making a little world where we'll be able to do that and have these different levels and you'll be able to see like hey this actually works uh, parenting if I have one item and I want that item to move with something else, I can parent it. So if I take this here 
And I'll duplicate it and make that one red. Okay, so I want these two items to move together. If I take the blue one and I say I'm going to parent you to the red one, then anytime I move the red one, the blue one goes with it. So that way, if I had a whole character, I'm not moving all the pieces individually. I'm moving one main element, and the whole body moves with it. Okay? As you get further into that, you'll figure out that parenting is more of like rigging. I wouldn't parent like all the fingers and the forearm and the upper arm to the main body. I would parent the fingertip to the next one, this one to that one, this one to my hand, my hand to my wrist, my wrist to my forearm, my forearm to my bicep, shoulder, and so on. That way, as I start moving around the character, everything kind of moves the way it would in the real world. Okay. Um, so again, we'll get more into that as we go, uh, but amazing stuff. Uh, we are also parenting both or all the features. So anything that I do to red happens to blue. So if I scale red down, you'll see blue also scales down. Um, using expressions, I can control just one item. So I can parent just position or just rotation or just scale, okay? Oops. Uh, pick whipping, perfect time for that. So let's take that off. And let's say that I only wanted to parent the position, okay? So when one moves, I want the other one to move. I'm going to alt click on the blue one. And this is where I could write that expression for how I want that to be controlled. Okay, that's what brings up the expression editor. Instead of writing an expression, I can just drag this. This is a pick whip. It allows me basically to say I want to parent or grab this attribute. So I'm going to grab this attribute here. So now blue and red are on top of each other. Okay, now we lost it, but they're on top of each other. If I turn off red, you can see blue. Okay, um, now I may want to, I'm going to undo that. This is where knowing some expressions comes in, so I'm going to pick whip that. And then I'm going to add its own position into that. And that gives me the ability to move this back to here. And now if I grab red and move it, blue will move by itself or move with red. But I could also move it independently or I can move it together. Okay, if I scale it, nothing happens. If I rotate it, nothing happens. Okay, so this is where we can start to drive different things. As we get into doing more of the advanced stuff, um, sound keys. There's a plugin that will um, get a chance to use called Sound Keys, and what this does is it actually analyzes a piece of audio. So let's say you have a piece of audio where you have like a constant beat happening throughout it, and you want your item to scale up with that constant beat. Every time it goes, do, do, you want it to scale up. You can take this, grab that area where you feel you see the beat happening, and then you can pick whip it to the scale of an item. So you tie those two attributes together. Or you can do the position. So maybe it just moves up and down, or maybe it rotates, depending on what you want to do with it. Uh, presets. Uh, we'll get, again, more into a lot of this stuff. Uh, presets are ways that we could have things animate onto the screen um, like we saved them. So if I had a piece of text and I wanted to animate that, um, obviously we could do position, rotation, scale, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but we also have presets. There they are. If I go to animation presets, I go to presets, I go to text transitions. And then I just drag, let's say that one. So nothing happens and then it's gorgeous, right? Um, there we go, cut off too soon, okay. Now, the first thing before we do any of the ones that are stocked in After Effects, we have to learn how to use those. So anything that we've animated, we can actually create a preset for and then utilize that preset over and over and over again, which is awesome. So if there's something where you're like, you know, I'm, I'm always grabbing it off the screen and then sliding it in here and then doing whatever with it, you can make a preset of that and just reapply that preset to 50 items or 100 items or whatever you want. 
Um, you could also take, let's say you had a um, slideshow, you have a thousand pictures, you can make a preset that would make the image scale up or make the image fade out or do different things. You can grab every single one of the layers, apply the preset, and it's done. Okay, so there's a huge amount of power in presets um, that you'll see when we get to that point. Uh, raster is just an image from Photoshop. Okay, anything that has pixel data, not vector data. Illustrator is vector, it remembers where your paths are and stuff like that. Um, Photoshop is just pixels, it's just coloring in pixels. Uh, real time preview. When you're looking at anything that's previewing, we hit play. We look up there at the top right. We haven't had to deal with this too much because everything has been pretty much in real time. But you can see right now I'm playing back at real time, 30 frames a second. If I wasn't, it would give me an error, not an error, it would just give me a red color there. So let's say that I duplicated this a bunch of times. And then Move it this, this, this. There we go. So let's see if it gives us that. It still might not do anything. I hope it's still in real time. All right. Well, eventually you'll see it. It'll say playing back at 22 frames a second, 23 frames a second. Typically it'll jump. As it plays, you'll see this green bar going across. That green bar is how much it's loading into the RAM of the computer. Okay. Uh, RAM basically is temporary storage for stuff that you're doing. If you find that you're working at home, your computer isn't going very fast, typically RAM is one of those things that will help speed it up because what happens is your computer is always sending stuff to the RAM, RAM runs out, and then it has to like rewrite and do all this other stuff. Uh, if you hit the play button and the green bar only goes so far, and then it doesn't do anything else, it just basically you're out of RAM. And you just have to um, purge it. There you go. And then you can hit play and then it'll refresh. Uh, render queue, we've talked about that. That's where we send our stuff to get actually rendered out. Resolution is the number of pixels left and right, up and down. Rotoscoping is using masks to isolate items. Um, and this is one of those things that if you ever watch any of the behind the scenes, like really behind the scenes movie stuff, you'll see them doing this. But someone's job is to go through and actually cut out. Uh, there we go. Is to cut out the characters so they can do different things to them. So like this guy here, he wasn't on a green screen. If they needed to cut him out from that background, somebody goes through and they draw masks for every single one of his shapes. Then they go to the next frame, move the mask, go to the next frame, move the mask, go to the next frame, move the masks. Same thing here. You can see the masks being drawn around the character. Uh, there's a rotoscope there. That there too. I don't know if that was actually rotoscope, but it looks like it was. Lots of, you basically have like a million keyframes, okay? So they'll use this to cut out elements so that they can replace them or modify them or tweak them. Sometimes in movies, they'll have like, you know, I want the character's eyes to be brighter, but not anything else. And they'll highlight the eyes. They'll make sure that that mask moves with it, and then they will brighten those up. Someone's job at big studios is just that. They literally go through and they draw around every character and do all the stuff and separate all the elements. Um, they're getting more away from doing green screening. Okay, so someone standing in front of a green screen is easy to do once it's set up. It's easy just to like click it off and make the green go away. Uh, but it's hard to do when you have a big complex shot. If you've seen any of the stuff from uh, Star Wars when they're doing green screen stuff, or like that, like Alice, all the stuff here all these different areas where they have these things green screened and separated, that's a lot of stuff for them to set up to make sure it's accurate and then for them to take out and then for them to put stuff back in. Uh, sometimes it's necessary 
Uh, but other times they still end up going through and cutting them out. So a lot of studios are really opting just to pay someone $10 an hour to sit there all day long and cut people out frame by frame. So that's a job. Uh, safe zones, and we discussed this one too. You're still playing. So we have title and action safe. So oops. Uh, the title safe area is on this inside one right here. That's where we would have our title er titles that we could put in there, any text that we would want to put inside of our animation. Typically should go there at the furthest, okay? Um, we don't have to worry about it too much, but let's say a device cuts it off, someone's screen, you want to make sure it's there. Um, so basically if you're inside that area with the majority of your important text, you should be good. Um, this is the action safe, okay? So any actions that happen, they can be a little bit further out. That way, if, in case someone you know gets punched or kicked or whatever, it happens there. Most of your stuff you're typically going to have in the center of your frame, or thinking about your uh, design class, your photography class. Um, oh, it doesn't have it in here. Uh, you would have the rule of thirds pop up, and then you'd be able to use the rule of thirds to kind of line up where things are happening, right? Um, sequence. I make an animation in another software like Maya or Cinema. And then when I come in here, I can bring in that sequence. So this is an animation. Uh, I guess that one works. Let's go to the other one. This. There we go. And then I import it. And then this is a sequence right there. So that's another piece of footage. I drop it onto my new composition. And there it is. And for some reason, my ground is black. But Grab the other one that doesn't have that. I guess that one does too. That's weird. So you'll see for every animation that I would have, I basically have one file for every frame. And that's what I would bring in. Oh, that's why. Interpret main. Ignore. There we go. Um, a solid, we played with that, it's just a blank image. Uh, track is, if you want something to match with the movement of another piece, okay? So let's say on this thing here, I wanted to put um, a piece of text that would follow the shape of that item, okay? Or follow a piece of it. I can make a layer and have it actually track the movement of that. You can see how slow this is going. Look at uh, two out of 30 frames per second. That's how fast it's playing back. And if I rewind it and hit play again, now it's going to go in real time until it hits the end of the green, and then it's going to load each one of those into the memory. Rewind again. OK. So tracking is one of those things where um, you're able to match stuff up, the movement of one item to another. Um, in the advanced software, so this is, this one's a bougie, I believe. Nope, it's match mover. So in some of the advanced softwares, they'll do this, which is 3D tracking. Uh, After Effects has um, one basic tracker called 2D tracker, and then it has a separate program called Mocha attached to it, which does different tracking. Um, so we'll have an assignment where we do that kind of tracking um, animation, there it is, track in Mocha. Um, there's also a camera tracker which will actually track a 3D camera just like that does. But you don't see it inside After Effects like this. Transition is moving from one item to another. Um, so color, scale, opacity, all of those are transitions. Uh, we are doing right now our transition assignment where we're creating a piece that will transition from one piece to another eventually, okay? Uh, trap code is a set of plugins from Red Giant. These are the ones that are on the computer. And that's what I mentioned before about you could get these plugins, download them at home as trials, and use them. Uh, once the trial runs out, you'll get a big red X on there. Nope. <laughs> yeah, I should have been expecting that. Uh, but they have these really cool plugins, like this one here is um, uh, Looks. What's it called? Something like that, bullet. 
I don't know. But this is like Instagram. You take your end clip, you bring it into here, and then there's all these presets that you can start off with. And then down here at the bottom, you can tweak what those presets are doing. So like how I showed how to create a vignette and how to change the colors, you drop your video into this plugin, um, and then it just goes whatever it does. There's the vignette. Here's some color adjustments. Um, there's so many cool things you can do with it. They make all of these plugins. The main ones that we're going to be using for this class or that we'll be discussing is looks. I'll eventually talk about that one. Um, oops, code. And then these ones. So this is uh, particular. If you had a bunch of items you wanted on the screen, let's say you wanted clouds, you wanted sparkles, you wanted whatever, uh, particular is where you can do that kind of thing. Uh, we'll also be talking about, um, not this one, this is form. But basically, you can take an image, and it'll form particles around the image. And you can do different cool things with that one. Uh, what was the other one? We'll do looks. I think I have these on mine. Uh, so we'll use shine. We'll use sound keys. We'll use star glow. And 3D stroke. And maybe lux. Yeah, they've got some cool ones, but you basically you get the whole pack and then you can play with them. Uh, shine just does, <laughs> so it'll shine from a hole in the item. There you go. There, so that's what shine does, but you can do more stuff. Uh, so definitely uh, recommended to check out. Um, these are pretty much industry standard things that everyone uses for one thing or another. Uh, even the stuff that we do in class, there's one way, you know, the way that I'm going to show how to use it, but there's a million other ways you could use it, right? You can use a hammer to build a house, but you can also use it to build a bench. Same thing there. Uh, vector is just an image based on strokes commonly built in Illustrator. By now, you should be familiar with vector and raster. Uh, vignette is just a darkening around the edges to bring more focus. And with any vignette that you have, it should be subtle. It should not be like crisp, unless you're trying to go for a specific look. So something like this, it's very harsh. You wouldn't want that on a regular piece of video because it actually resembles more like one of those old school movies or like a film card or something like that. Um, this has a vignette. This is actually like a too soft of a vignette where it's like really dark here and really bright there. So look at your stuff from an objective perspective as to what is going to look good and what is not. There you go. So like this really looks like you know those old images. Uh, and then the work area we have discussed as well. That is just right where we're kind of previewing. So right here in the center, that's what we're previewing. That's our work area. There's that shine doing its thing. And then star glow is a fun one too. Yeah, like sparkles on top. Sweet. Cool. So that's all we have for definitions. Are there any questions on the definition? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this button here. So all we have to do is we would click that. And that puts it into 3D mode so that we could then get more rotates, scales, and whatever else. Correct. It's just literally just like it, uh, the way that it's displaying it. Because there's no geometry there. So, and you can't export any of the stuff out. Um, when the biggest thing that you will find when you get out there is how do I get done the project I want to get done. Sometimes it's going to be going into 3D, sometimes it's going to be sticking in 2D or a mix of both. Uh, as I work inside of a 3D app, sometimes I want to bring everything right into, mo right into After Effects the way it is, and you can't. You have to export out a certain way so that it brings in like the cameras and the lights and the whatever else. But they're not actual lights, they're not an actual like 3D camera. As far as we're concerned, it moves like 3D, and it uh, acts like 3D, but it's not an actual like 3D environment. Cool. Anything else?
All right.